In this lecture, we're going to be talking about the properties of gases. And we're going to start with kinetic molecular theory and Boyle's law. In your textbook, it's pages 96 to 111. By the end of this lecture, you'll be able to describe the empirical properties of all gases, compare and contrast ideal gases to real gases, you'll be able to communicate pressure in a variety of units, you'll be able to relate the kinetic molecular theory to the physical properties of gases, and you'll be able to perform calculations involving Boyle's Law. So gases were researched heavily in the 18th century, and they are found to have the following macroscopic properties. Uh, the first is gases are highly compressible, so gases change their shape, and they can be squished down into smaller containers, much like we squish propane into a propane bottle. Um, solids and liquids are not compressible to any um, great amount. Gases mix evenly and completely, which means all gases mix with all other gases. Uh, this is much different than solids. Solids may or may not mix with each other, and they don't mix well. They don't mix evenly. Um, and liquids may or may not mix evenly depending on the type of intermolecular forces in them. So uh, that makes gases different than both li liquids and solids. Gases have low viscosity. They float quickly through space. And gases diffuse. They move spontaneously through all the available space uh, given to them. Gases also have very low densities. So when we're talking about gases, we're going to start with the idea of an ideal gas. Now this isn't a real gas, but it's a gas that has all of the properties that gases should. So based on the properties we just mentioned, an ideal gas is a substance that fills and assumes the shape of its container, it diffuses rapidly, and mixes readily with other substances. Ideal gases are considered to be point masses, so they, they have mass, but they have no volume, which isn't true of any gas that actually exists, but because molecules are so small, we're going to assume that when they're in gaseous state, they have no actual size that matters. They only interact through elastic, elastic collisions because they're moving so quickly and they're so spread out that when eventually they do hit each other, they don't exert or experience intermolecular forces. So it's important to realize that these gases are theoretical, but that most gases really do approach the idea of an ideal gas. So kinetic molecular theory is the other half of what we're going to discuss in this lecture, and it states that it's basically an explanation of how matter interacts on a atomic level. So it says that the smallest particle of a substance is always in continuous random motion. And when we talk about particles, we can be talking about molecules, atoms, or ions. These particles always travel in straight lines unless they collide with another particle, which can include the wall of a container. So when a particle collide, when particles collide, they're going to, there's a couple of things that can happen. Uh, a change in matter may occur, there could be a chemical reaction, or it could just be a change in orientation. So when molecules collide, they can react if they hit a certain way with a certain amount of energy, and this is the collision reaction theory. And the other thing that kinetic molecular theory says that is that we can measure kinetic energy by measuring the temperature of a substance. So the temperature of a substance is directly related to the amount of motion, or the average amount of motion, in a sample of that substance. So here's just a couple of pictures of the movement of gases. Um, an ideal gas, uh, particles are moving randomly, uh, and when they collide with either each other or with a, uh, the container, they bounce in an elastic condition, collision. And the path of any individual molecule always follows a straight line. The only time the, the, the direction of a molecule changes, or a particle changes, is when it collides into something else. So the other thing that we noticed about gases is, is that gases are affected by both temperature and pressure. Now temperature, when we increase the temperature of a gas, its volume increases. If the container is expandable, then, then the volume will increase as temperature increases. If the container is not expandable, then the pressure inside that container will increase instead. So for the first example, we can think of a balloon. 
Um, a balloon is an expandable container. And as we increase the temperature of a balloon, it'll actually increase in volume. If the container isn't expandable, and here we could think of like, and I my my favorite would be something like a um, propane tank. If you increase the temperature, then that then the contents th will increase in pressure. So this gets us to get to a couple definitions here. The first is pressure, which is the force per unit er area. It's measured in units called kilopascals or pascals. And there are also a bunch of older units as well, units that were used before pascals were invented. Um, and so what we're going to be doing is actually having to convert between pascals and other units called, for example, tor or millimeters of mercury. The Hg is mercury, uh, a millibar, and an atmosphere. Also, it's important to, uh, we have a couple of standards. So STP is standard temperature and pressure. It's 0 degrees Celsius and 101.325 kilopascals. And it was, it's generally measured at sea level or the pressure at sea level is 101.325 kilopascals. Uh, standard ambient temperature uh, is used a lot of the time because um, when experiments are conducted, conducting them at zero degrees Celsius makes things rather cold for scientists. So standard ambient temperature and pressure is more what it would be like in a, in a lab situation. And so that's 25 degrees and 100 kilopascals. When we're measuring pressure, what we're actually doing is we're measuring the force of, um, in this case, a gas against the walls of its container or against a surface. So when we measure pressure, when we're talking about the pressure at sea level, what we're actually doing is we're measuring the force that air molecules are exerting on the surface of the Earth. And so this slide is showing the surface of the Earth or the column of air above one square meter of Earth. and at sea level, the force of that air is 101,325 newtons. And so when we put that in a one by one square area, then that's how we get our pascals. It's the number of newtons over one square meter. And that's a pascal newton times the area in which it's being applied. So what that means is the mass of that air would be 10,329 kilograms. And then down at the bottom here, um, it's not something you'll have to memorize. You'll be allowed to have it on any test. But here are the conversions between atmospheres, uh, millimeters of mercury, pascals, kilopascals, and bars or millibars. And so we're just going to do some unit conversions. So atmospheres to millimeters of mercury. And I find the easiest way to do these is to set up a ratio. So we, we want to get 1.25 atmospheres into millimeters of mercury. So we want x millimeters of mercury over 1.25 atmospheres. So when these two things are equal, we're going to get a ratio of 1. And then we're going to make this equal to our unit conversion. So we know that from the previous slide, 760 millimeters of mercury are the same as one atmosphere. And so from that, we're going to just do a bit of cross multiplication, or we're just going to actually clear our denominator, and we're going to find out x is going to be equal to 760. And I'm just going to cut my units out to save some space times 1.25 over 1. And our atmospheres are going to cancel because we have atmospheres here, atmospheres here, and we le we'll be left in units of millimeters of mercury. And when we run it through, we should get 950 millimeters of mercury. Here we want millimeters of mercury into kilopascals, so same idea. 
going to set up a ratio. We want to get the kilopascals, so I'm going to put kilopascals on the top of my ratio. So x kilopascals over 600 millimeters of mercury is equal to, and now the ratio we're going to use is the one between kilopascals and millimeters of mercury. So for kilopascals, it's 101.325, and we can see this on a previous slide, 101.325 kilopascals over 760 millimeters of mercury. And then again, we will do the, we're going to multiply, or we're going to isolate our x, so we're going to end up with x being equal to 600 times 101.325 divided by 760 millimeters of mercury. And again, in this, this time, our millimeters of mercury are going to cancel out. We have millimeters of mercury with the 600 and millimeters of mercury with our 760, and we'll be left with units of kilopascals. And so when we run it through a calculator, we should get 79.99 kilopascals. We only have three significant digits, so we're going to round up to 80.0 kilopascals. And for our final one, uh, 500 torr to millibars. Now, torr and millimeters of mercury are the same thing. And so we want to go 2 millibars, so x millibar over 500 torr is equal to, and from our scale on our previous page, we can see that 1013.2. Two five millibars is the same as seven hundred and sixty tor. When we isolate our variable, we're going to get five hundred times one thousand thirteen point two five, and we're going to divide that by seven hundred and sixty tor. And this will give us 666 millibar. And so there are some unit conversions. Uh, I find the easiest way to do them is when we set up our ratios, put the unknown on the top of the ratio, and then use your equalities from the last page as your second ratio. And so when it came to measuring pressure, here's one of the reasons we have different units. Um, Torcelli was, and this is where the tour comes from, uh, used mercury, a mercury barometer, to measure air pressure. And so what this, what this device did is it measured the height of a mercury column that could be sustained by the air pressure of a given, given area. And he found that at sea level, and so you have to remember the air pressure is pushing down here on our pool of mercury allowing this mercury to be pushed up the tube. And so up here is a vacuum, so the mercury is trying to pull out, but the atmospheric pressure is holding it in. And so Tercelli found that at sea level, at the atmospheric pressure could hold a column of mercury 760 millimeters tall. So millimeters of mercury, same as a tor, both because of this barometer set up by uh, Torricelli. Other interesting fact is it was one of the first uh, vacuums that was created. Uh, and this is how water, pump, water pumps work in a similar way. What water pumps do is they allow the atmosphere to push water up through the ground. By building that vacuum, um, the water starts to get pulled up into that vacuum space. Atmospheric pressure was pushing on the ground water. And it was found that the atmospheric pressure can only push water up to a height of 10 meters. After that, it doesn't matter how much of a vacuum you have um, above the water, the water can't go any higher than 10 meters up a column. 
And now we'll talk about Boyle's Law, the relationship between the pressure of a gas and the volume of a gas. So as the pressure of a gas increases, the volume decreases. This should make sense if you squeeze a gas, um, if you push down on the gas, you're pushing molecules closer together, and so the volume is going to decrease. As long as all other variables remain constant, in this case, we're talking specifically about temperature. So as long as the temperature remains constant, then this is the relationship between volume and temperature, or volume and pressure. So it can be given by the following relationship. Uh, the pressure and volume at any given time, if we know the pressure and volume at one time, as long as we know one of the other two variables, we can calculate the last. And so here's a couple of relationships. If we look at the volume versus pressure graph on a sample of gas, you can see what's called an inverse relationship. As the volume decreases, the pressure increases. So here we have a high volume, 20 milliliters, and a relatively low pressure, less than 1,000. As we squish this gas, so as the volume decreases, here the volume is only 5, we have a pressure over 3,000 kilopascals. So this is called an inverse relationship. If you graph the inverse, so here what we've done is we've taken our pressures and just taken 1 and divided it by our pressure, we end up with a linear graph. So volume versus inverse pressure results in a linear graph or a straight line graph. And the slope of this line tells us the relationship between our volume and our pressure. So if we get talk about a little bit about Boyle's Law and the motion of molecules, if the temperature and the amount of gas remain constant, the external pressure increases. And the external pressure increases, it will be larger than the internal pressure. So here we have a situation where everything's happy. We have the pressure outside of our container and the pressure inside of our container the same. So this, this little piston won't move. If we increase the pressure outside, so if we increase this pressure outside, or if we pushed on that piston, or on our syringe, then it'll start to close. And it will close until the pressure inside our container is the same as that on the outside. So if we increase the pressure on the outside, the pressure on the inside will also have to increase. And it'll stop shrinking, or our space will stop shrinking, when the two pressures are equal. When we do this, we're reducing the amount of space for gas molecules. So as the volume decreases, the molecules get closer together, they'll collide with one another more frequently, and that's how we measure pressure. So now we're going to do some math. And I find the easiest way to do these problems is to make a list. So here we have uh, 15 cubic centimeters, there's a volume. It's collected at STP. That gives us a temperature and a pressure. Temperature and pressure. Calculate the new volume if the pressure changes to 9.5 kilopascals and the temperature is kept constant. So if we take a look, we have a volume of 15 cubic centimeters. We have an initial pressure of 101.325 kilopascals, and that comes from our STP, standard pressure. We are looking for a volume, so we're looking for our new volume. We've been given a new pressure, so the new pressure is 9.5 kilopascals. So our pressure has dropped quite a bit, so we should expect the volume to increase quite a bit in response to that. And now we can use Boyle's Law. We can say V1 P1 is equal to V2 P2. And we're trying to solve for P2, so I'm going to isolate that variable by dividing both sides by P2. On my left-hand side, P2 stays. On my right-hand side, P2 cancels. So I end up with V2 being equal to V1 P1 over P2. And then I plug in my numbers. So my volume 1 was 15 cubic centimeters. My volume 
my first pressure is 101.325 kilopascals and my pressure is 9.5 my second pressure 9.5 kilopascals and then it's just a matter of crunching the numbers 15 times 101.325 divided by 9.5 and we get 159.98 a whole bunch of other stuff and our units are going to be kilopascals cancel, kilopascals cancel, so cubic centimeters and then we take a look at our significant digits, we're only allowed to keep two so we're going to round up and it's going to be 1.6 times 10 squared centimeters cubed. There's our new volume, or 160 cubic centimeters. We'll try another one here. So here we want to calculate the volume occupied by 5 cubic meters of nitrogen gas at STP if we increase the pressure and maintain temperature. So again we make a little list. We have an initial volume of 5 cubic meters. We have STP as our initial pressure. So pressure is equal to 101.325 kPa's and we have a new pressure. So pressure 2 is equal to 500 kPa's and we're looking for that second volume again. So when we do that, we just take a quick look. Our pressure is increased by a factor of almost 5, so our volume should decrease by about the same factor. So if we, because these are inversely related, we can kind of guess what our answer should be. So if we multiply 1 by 5, the other one is going to be 5 times smaller. So we should end up with an answer around 1. So V1, P1 is equal to V2, P2. And again, we're looking for that second volume. So I'm going to divide both sides by pressure to isolate my volume. And so V2 is equal to V1 P1 over P2. And then plug in my numbers. Uh, the first volume is 5 meters cubed multiplied by 101.325 kilopascals divided by 500 kilopascals and then we print our numbers and once we do all of our rounding we get an answer of 1 meter cubed. It's 101.325 or 1.01325 but with sig digs we only have one so only one in our answer. So one more example here, we have 90 cubic centimeters of gas collected at, and here's our pressure. The nice thing about Boyle's Law and even Charles's Law is that we, well, Boyle's Law, Charles's Law is a little bit different, but for Boyle's Law, we can keep the units that we're given. So since we're given units in cubic centimeters and uh, tor, we can leave our units in tor. We don't need to convert unless the question actually specifically asks us to convert. So we're going to want to find pressure when we decrease volume. So we started with 90 centimeters cubed and this is volume 1 are collected in a syringe at and we got pressure 1 being 731 torr. The temperature remains constant. We always want to watch for this. If the temperature isn't constant we can't use Boyle's Law and we want to determine the pressure inside the syringe, so we're looking for P2 this time. And our volume is reduced by 25, so volume 2 is 90 minus 25, so it's going to be 65 centimeters cubed. And now we get out Boyle's Law. Now these formulas are not provided to you, so you need to memorize them for any tests. And now we want to isolate 
the second pressure. So because we want to get pressure Q by itself, we're going to divide both sides by the second volume. That way, on this side, it cancels. And so pressure 2 is equal to V1 P1 over V2. And now we plug in our numbers, and we get 90 centimeters cubed times our initial pressure, 731 torr, divided by our volume of 65 centimeters cubed. The centimeters cubed cancel, and we're going to end up with an answer in torr. We'll go 90 times 731, and divide by 65. So, 1012 torr. When we take a look, since our volume decreased, we should be expecting our pressure to increase, and it did. And now we check our sig digs. We're only allowed 2, so 1.0 times 10 to the 3 torr. We're just moving that decimal place 1, 2, 3 spots over. So 1.0 times 10 to the 3. Uh, for homework, you can try page 110, questions 1-2.